People are like, you get nervous? I'm like, yeah, I'm like, yes, I still get nervous, but now I'm not nervous anymore. Once I start talking, I'm absolutely positively not nervous. How's that for like a phony pose? <laughs> you gotta, this is the shit you gotta do. Um, so, um, actually, well, we're gonna talk about core training, and you know, Chris was like, what do you wanna talk about? And I try to talk about things because we find here the vast majority of the people that we're dealing with are personal trainers, are people that are dealing with kind of average general public, and so I want to talk about something because I think this is as applicable to the athletes that I deal with as it is to some 75-year-old person that you might be personal training. So it, it ends up being a really good topic for this type of audience. I was like, Thank you. Pat Beef is great. He's kind of my partner in a lot of these. Um, I, I always say DVDs. They're not even really DVDs anymore. I guess they do have DVDs, but they're more like download. It's kind of this modern millennial thing where you're like selling something that doesn't even really exist. You're like, I'll sell you access to something that you get in cyberspace. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But Pat pushes me to do these projects, which is really good. He keeps me kind of on my toes saying we should do something new. Chris and his staff obviously let us do this because it really is. I love, you'll see, I'm going to have a lot of fun. I don't really give a shit if you guys have any fun at all, but I believe that you will. But it won't matter to me as long as it's one person who sits near the front and laughs, I'll be good. But um, my staff is I get to leave and actually now I get to stay here till. Monday night at 12 o'clock because of the um, snowstorm, so our flight is already canceled on the way home. Um, two more days in San Francisco, which I wasn't planning on, and my son is going to learn how to shovel snow, which is really good. And then obviously all of you guys are showing up. I always say we couldn't do it without you, but the reality is I can stand here by myself and give it to So I can really do it without you. Maybe set the camera up, I can do the exact same thing. Um, but it's more fun. Like Todd said, the same. This is all my contact info. That is my email address. That's the only email address that I have. AOL is code for old. Um, <laughs> Hotmail is code for cheap. So if you have a Hotmail address, you can change it. Like Gmail is cool. Like every email has tells says something about you. AOL just says you're old, <laughs> which I am. Like Chris, like oh, he's been around for a really long time. I'm like yeah, I'm old. I'm actually sixty this year, which is freaking scary. That I can still do this. And I, I'm going to be 60 and I'm on Instagram, which is cool. So follow me because I'm going to hit 50,000 followers very soon, which is even cool. I didn't even know, like Instagram, I, one of the guys that works with me has been doing a really good job, Kevin Farmer, moving his medicine on Instagram. And one day he said, Yo, we have 25,000 followers. We have 25,000. I was thinking it was just a place where my wife posted pictures and then I realized he's got 25,000 followers. So the next day I was on Instagram. I've been on Twitter forever. I was like an original Twitter user, but so, but it's all up there, and I do. I answer every email, unless, like I said, if you want a pen pal, sorry, like don't email me every day asking questions. But if you have a legitimate question, I will give you a legitimate answer. Um, this is where I spend most of my time from a teaching standpoint right now. So that's what I'm So again, if you really do have questions and you want to talk every day, pay me fifteen bucks, and I'll talk to you. Every day. Okay, but for, for nothing, I'll probably talk to you twice and then tell you to stop all that. Um, <laughs> So what are we going to try to do today? I think, and Dana did a really good job kind of leading it off. It was great that I got the staff to sit and listen to her talk a little bit about breathing. So you can't really talk about core training without talking about breathing. But hopefully what we want to do is, is clear up some misconceptions, some disagreements, and, and hopefully make this thing make sense. Because I've, as I've gone through the process, and you'll see in the presentation, sometimes I think it gets more confusing than enlightening. And what we're going to hopefully do is highlight the similarities versus the differences. Because I do think, from a core training standpoint, what I'm hoping when we're done between this and the practical is that you're like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. And if it doesn't, then I did a shit job and I'll have to redo this stuff. But I think it will. So, what do we want to talk about here? Basically, smart people change their mind, use simple language, talk less but say more, stay teachable and ask questions. So what I want you to think about here is, based on the information above, are you smart? Will you be smarter at the end of today? Because one of the things that drives me crazy about our industry in particular is kind of the narrow-mindedness, the know-it-allness that comes with the industry. Everybody's got all the answers. <laughs> and I look at it, you should probably have more questions. But So hopefully when we get done today, you'll be a little bit smarter. What we want you to do is see the similarities, as I said, not the differences. So don't get caught up on, well, so-and-so says this. 
Yeah, and when it comes to core training, you've got to realize there's a lot of kind of competing theories out there. What I want you to do is see the similarities in what we're going to talk about and say, okay, there's a lot of commonalities that we can look at, right? And then Ron Ruska, um, Dana had mentioned PRI, Postural Restoration Institute, Postural Restoration Institute. It's a really interesting group. I started writing something the other day, and you know, one of the things I've realized is that the Postural Restoration Group made me think a lot and made me change very little. <laughs> so, and that's what I want to talk about. So I, I read a lot of the stuff, I watched a lot of the videos, I thought a lot, I thought a lot, and then when it really came down to, okay, what am I gonna do differently? Not very much, but the, not, the part that is different is important, so we're gonna talk about that. But Ruska is the founder, brilliant guy, and one of the things that he says right in the beginning of their first program is use this information to make your existing program that you're comfortable with better. And I took that quote up because that's what I want you to do. I want you to use this information to make your existing program, because everybody in here has some sort of training philosophy. I'm gonna hopefully get you to change it today, at least a little bit, and think, oh, that's a really good cue. I should be doing that that way. Because for us, when we're developing our philosophy, that's what we do. We're constantly kind of picking away at other people's good stuff and saying, hey, that's a really good piece of something good that we can incorporate into what we're doing. And that's what I'm hoping everybody in the room will do today, is keep an open mind, not get defensive, not think, oh, he's wrong, or, and just sit and listen, and then we'll get into the practical, get on the floor, which is where we're gonna be almost the whole time, and try this thing. And this is really important. Don't let your learning lead to knowledge. Let your learning lead to, lead to action. Because I think the other thing that I find is people will come and sit in these seminars for the whole day and then not go back and change it. If you don't change stuff Monday with your clients, you should have gone drinking. You should have gone like the Sausalito, you know, and looked at the houseboat. You should have done something fun, not sat here all day. Like if you don't get something out of this that makes you think, Hey, that's better. My whole life is being is spent looking for somebody smarter than me who's doing better than me. All the time. All I want to do is find people smarter than me who do better than me so I can steal this shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then I can come up here and present it to you. And then you think I'm smart, which is unbelievable. I'm going to talk about all other people's stuff here today. And you're going to leave me like, I'm so smart. No, not really. It's just like a little bit of a pickpocket, like you can just slide stuff out of somebody else's ideas and put ideas, and then you think they're smart. This guy, he's a good guy to steal some stuff from, Simon Sinek. If you have not read Start With Why, really, really good book. And I think last year at, uh, at the summit, I think 10 people had a Start With Why slide in their presentation. But it's, it tells you something, right? If 10 people are saying this had a really big impact on me, it's probably a good read. But what Sinek calls this the golden circle. Why is always in the middle? So we're gonna to try to focus a lot on the why. Why are we doing what we're doing? Then how are we gonna do it? And then the last thing is the what. And we, every time I've done one of these talks, one, most of us in training, in strength and conditioning, in fitness, whatever it is that we're in, we love to start with what. We have a what, like we're a kettlebell person or we're a whatever person. And then we start thinking, well, I got a what, now I gotta get how, I gotta figure out how to get better at doing it but they don't even have a why. You gotta have a why, you gotta know, okay, why am I doing this? Why is this important? And hopefully we're gonna hit on that, right? This is another amazing book, Think Like a Freak, I love this book. This was the, I always gonna say my favorite book of last year, I don't know, it might be my second favorite book of last year. But I love this book, Conventional Wisdom is Often Wrong and a Blight Acceptance of It Can Lead to Sloppy, Wasteful, or Even Dangerous Outcomes. The conventional wisdom is often wrong. So what you think is right is often wrong. And I get accused, people, it's funny, people like, I read something the other day about me, and they said, Mike Corley is such an idiot, he's all over the place, he's constantly changing his mind. And I was like high-fiving myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, I'm being criticized for learning, I love this. This is amazing that there are people in our industry who will be critical of you, oh, Mike Corley is always reading books and learning stuff. <laughs> And then he's changing what he's doing. Like, why can't he be a freaking moron like the rest of us do the same thing he did 20 years ago? Right? But it's amazing. That's people's criticism. I'm like, that's the best criticism I've ever gotten. I'm 60 years old. I'm still changing. I'm still evolving. I'm still trying to get better. Thank you very much. Criticize me again. But this was interesting. Thomas Myers got up one day and said, 50% of what I'm going to tell you is wrong. 
I just don't know which 50%. <laughs> And that's true. I might be looking at you two years from now being like, oh shit, oh that was wrong, sorry. I really thought at the time I really thought that I was right, but I was wrong. Now I really think that I'm right. I will tell you that right now at this moment, everything that I believe, I'm telling you is correct. I'm also telling you that that's probably not true. <laughs> Just because based on experience, I know that it wasn't always true, but I, I never like got up here and lied and said, oh, I think this is a really bad way to train, and I'm going to tell people to do it anyway. No, I believed it. And then, got a little smarter, and you'll see as we go, right? But I do really believe this, Einstein, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it. And this is one another thing. I, any, anytime I watch a presentation and I can't understand what the person is saying, my automatic thought is they suck at what they do. Because if they can't make it simple, and I'm sorry, anybody get offended by swearing? If you are, you should leave. So I, so I'm, I'm not going to stop at all. I will not have fun at all, but I will not stop using the, any of those other words. But if you can't explain it simple, if I can't make everybody understand it, then I don't understand it. And, and we've all had that professor like in college where you kind of sit there and you're like, this guy's really smart, he's got a PhD in something. I have no idea what he's talking about today at all. Zero. I don't want to be that guy. If I'm being that guy, raise your hand and say you're being that guy. Because any fool can make something complicated that takes a genius to make it simple. I don't want to make this complicated. I want you to walk out of here today and think, okay, I have a way better idea on how to do this core training thing than I did when I started. Should we do what we've always done? I don't think so. Because I do think a lot of times the way we always did it was wrong. It's amazing how we cling to stuff and people will say, that's the way we always did it. And I should have put that slide. I don't know. No, I put it in this is a different one, but I just put in a slide in my other presentation of um, a covered wagon in an airplane. Because at one point, if someone had said, how do I get from Massachusetts to California? I would have, someone would have said covered wagon, right? It was the way to go. Best route. Far going trail, you don't go off route. But if you said to me today, uh, you know, I'm going to California and I'm going to take a covered wagon, I would think you were pretty stupid. I feel like the airplane thing is actually going to work out reasonably well for the last 50 or 60 years, and you should probably give it a whirl. But it's amazing how people, and this, this example is an even better one. This is actually, and so in this, um, uh, uh, Lee Cockrell's book, Creating Magic, he talks about the, uh, the Germans during World War II were firing shells every 20 seconds. And they, we were firing shells every 30 seconds. And the general was like, they're firing, you know, one more shell a minute than we are. We need to figure out what's going on here. We'll get two shells a minute, they're getting three. And so he sent a colonel to look. He said, figure out why we're waiting 30 seconds. And the guy came back and he's like, hold up the manual. It's in the manual. It says, fire the shell, wait 30 seconds. And the general was like, that's not going to cut it for me. You need to go back and figure this out. So the guy goes back to the World War I manual, exact same thing. Fire the shell, wait 30 seconds. The guy who goes back and somehow manages to get into the archives and get a Civil War manual. And in the Civil War manual it says, fire the cannon and wait 30 seconds to steady the horses. <laughs> right? But, and this is a true story. We were waiting 30 seconds because everyone said, well, that's what you do. You fire the cannon and you wait 30 seconds. But it was based on the idea that the horses were jittery from the sound. That's us a lot of times in fitness. It's amazing how people will argue about this is the way we're supposed to do it without any scientific basis at all. That was the way to do it, right? That was a, when I was a kid, we were probably doing exactly that hooking our feet into something, holding a plate behind our head. That was core training when I was a kid. And you're looking at that saying, no, that really, I mean, yeah, that was core training when I was a kid. I'm not, I'm not joking. <laughs> that might have been a little bit before my time, but it had not evolved very much. And that was probably core training when Dwayne was a freshman. So I, poor Dwayne's in the front row, he knows I didn't make fun of him. He was actually one of my athletes, and I won't say how old he is, but I think the first letter is five. That was the first number of rounds. <laughs> um, so we talk about this idea of core training. One of the things we've got to figure out is this is what's hard for everybody. Well, what even is it? Because core is total bullshit. I mean, everybody, oh, it's all about core. I mean, it's so overdone 
and so over discussed, yet at the same time we look at it and say, okay, well, what are we actually talking about? So if we look at this, is that the core? Some of you might look and go, yep, that's definitely it. Right? Rectus abdominis, internal oblique, external oblique, definitely that's core. Transverse, transverse, transverse was huge for a while. Like it was all about transverse for a couple of years, decade, whatever. Right? What about, is that core? Intercostals, multifidus, QL, yep. How about that? Glute medius? Yeah, maybe. How about that? Dane was talking about diaphragm, right? Core? Absolutely. How about that, iliacus psoas, adductus? <laughs> I would look at this and say, literally all of the above. So pretty much, if we were talking about core training, I'd say, well, it's kind of everything like sort of from the insides of your knees up to about here. <laughs> Maybe not including your pecs and lats, but it's a pretty broad expanse of stuff that we're gonna talk about when we start talking about core training. And it's not just deep abdominal muscles. Right, I'm sorry. So what's the definition? I think core is a deliberately constrained transfer system. That doesn't sound very simple though. But it is, I mean core, like this section is really designed for things, but what are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to get force from the ground, generally speaking, out our hands. And in order to do that, we have to have this transfer system in the middle that's gonna allow us to transfer energy. That transfer system is deliberately constrained. Like that's, I used to, that's why, and I'll, I'll, I'll apologize to the other people on one hand and I'll criticize them on the other hand. You know, people are always like, the well, spine's gonna be free to move. And I'm like, no, actually, it doesn't. That's a bad idea. Okay, the spine should not be free to move at all. The spine should actually be pretty goddamn restricted. Because if it's not, you get hurt. Okay, so we've gotta think about this deliberately constrain the transfer system, and then we've got to think about how are we going to deliberately constrain it. But one of the best analogies, if we brought a rope out here, if I brought one of the heavy battling ropes out, and I said, I want you to, I'm going to lay the rope flat on the ground, and I want you to push it to the other end of the room. You'd laugh, is that kidding? You'd be like, that would be really hard to do, wouldn't it? And you'd look at me and you'd say, I need to figure out some way to stiffen the rope, right? Exactly, you need to figure out some way to stiffen the rope so you can get force to transfer through. So that's the stuff we got to think about. So core stability, the ability to move the hips or the extremities without compensatory movement of the spine. This is actually the key thing that we're looking for. We're talking about core training. When someone says core stability, what I think of when I say core stability is, can you move your arm without moving your spine? Can you move your leg without moving your spine? If you can do that, now you're probably on your way to one, being relatively pain-free in life, and two, being able to do a lot of things that we want you to do from up. I, and I would always say, I guess my world is sports, but it's just from a life standpoint, right? You've gotta be able to move. When, the reason it gets confusing is if you listen to Greg <coughs> talk sometimes, he'll talk about motor control. And I would look at motor control and be like, motor control's probably core stability because if that person has good motor control, I would say, well, yeah, that person probably has good core stability. That person has kind of all, and Shirley Simon uses the quote, she had the right muscles moving the right joints at the right time. And that's really what it's gonna be about, is the right muscles moving the right joint at the right time, or the right muscles not allowing the wrong joints to move at the wrong time. That's really what we're talking about. And it's tough to quantify, but poor motor control is really obvious. Like, it's like, uh, the pornography in the Supreme Court, remember that ruling? Where the, one of the Supreme Court justices said, um, I know pornography when I see it, <laughs> right? And it's pretty accurate. I know good motor control when I see it. I can look at something and be like, no, that's not good. And I always use, I call it the shit test, right? If you're around my backyard, I have three dogs, and if I said to go walk around my yard and point to anything that looked like shit, You'd probably be dead on 100%. You'd probably be able to, like, shit, shit, that's a joke. Yeah, right? <laughs> but I think training is exactly the same way. Like, I, we, I always thought about doing a presentation, like, shit or not shit, right? Just put up, like, shitty technique from YouTube. And, and I say, okay, you know, we're going to vote shit or not shit. You know, you'd like, you'd all be probably, I bet we'd be 90% where you'd be like, oh, that was really shitty. That was not good at all. And then you look at something else, like, that's really good. Yeah, so that's not shitty. It's not really that hard. 
to be able to look at this stuff and see that's gonna keep you're good. If you keep laughing, I'm gonna be okay. This is all I did. I just need one. So what are we really gonna do? We're gonna try to take stuff from Paul Hodges. And Paul Hodges was the big like transverse abdominus guy. If you if you've been hanging around for a while, if you've been doing this for 20 years and you've been in physical therapy, you know, he was the guy that, that kind of made transverse abdominus famous. He made you get out my anatomy book and find where the transverse abdominus was. Then, you know, McGill came along, Joey Sarman, Porterfield, Rosa, Ron Roska, Philip Beast. There's all these people out here that are talking about relatively the same thing. But what we've really got to be able to do is pull all this stuff in together and say, okay, how do we use the information that all these people are giving us to help us help our clients, to help us help our athletes? Because that's ultimately what we're going to try to do. One thing I will tell you is this drives me out of my mind. Be careful with people who tell you the experts are wrong. Like, I love, and I won't say, I could sit here and just bash some of my people on the internet who I don't really like very much by name, but I won't do that. But I love when someone says, yeah, I don't, I don't agree with Stuart McGill. I'm like, really? You freaking genius. You're, I'm like, and you've spent exactly how many years in the lab with spines? Oh, I'm none. I've never actually looked at a real spine or anything. I just don't think it's right. And you're like, then that is based on, oh, my, my own training. Like, so your own training has caused you to realize that a person who spent his entire life studying the spine knows less than you. To which their answer is almost always yes. Yes, that's exactly what I said. I am smarter than this guy who spent his entire adult life studying the spine, but based on, you can do sit ups with nothing. I've never, I've never heard myself. So, I mean, again, the good thing about, the good thing about our field, seriously, one is that 60 year old men can still give, or 59 year old men can still give presentations. That's one good thing about our field. Um, but I was, you know, in the shallow pool, the midget stands tall. <laughs> we, don't, we don't need to be very good because we're competing with primarily idiots. <laughs> Seriously, we are. So it's not hard that like, you can be a fitness expert by just not being a total loser <laughs> and trying to hurt people. Like, okay, I'm, just gonna, I'm actually going to try to help people get better. And people are <laughs> this is the other thing. We have our training. This is where a lot of us got caught up. And I, again, I've done the good thing about 59 years is that you get to do everything wrong and then you get to do it better. So I've done everything wrong. You know what I mean? I've done sit ups and crunches and held plates behind my head and put my feet under stuff. And, you know, I've done the Fit for Life uh, mm -hmm. app program that I can't remember the name of it anymore, but it came with a yellow book. Like, I've done, you know, hanging knee ups. Like, I've done everything wrong that you can possibly do. Which is why I feel like I'm getting a little bit closer to right. But we need to be careful because, again, there was when the Paul Hodges thing came up, there was a bunch of us, we were buying blood pressure cuffs and we were having people laying on the ground, you know, trying to press their back down in and make a gauge and the blood pressure cuff go up. And it all seemed like a good idea at the time. Like, everything seems like a good idea at the time when you're doing something really stupid, right? I mean, and that applies to drinking, it applies to a lot of things. Like, it seemed like a good idea at the time. I'm like, like when you're, maybe when you're 12 years in, you're like, that seemed, that seemed like a brilliant theory. You know, you ever watch, watch Ridiculousness for a couple of hours, so then you run. There's a lot of things that seem like a good idea at the time, right? But we have to be careful, we have to realize, with clients, we're not physical therapists, we're not doing rehab, it may be different if you say, hey, I'm gonna develop a business around people with that pain. That may be different, but the, the warning is don't get so caught up boring your clients to death with stuff that they don't even need to do. So we're gonna show you really simple stuff, right? Stuff that probably falls in the need to do versus the nice to do category. And as I said, like my two day program, so you don't do a lot of core work. Like, you mean you're not doing a lot of core work? No. Two day program, you don't have that much time. If I see someone for two hours a week, I'm not gonna spend this inordinate amount of time on just core training because I realize they've got a lot of stuff that they wanna get done during that time period. So as I said, this is what's you know, the history of core, right? From straight leg sit up with a bar held behind your neck or a plate held on your chest or whatever it is. And I was thinking it goes through, you know, I mean, when I, was, when I first started out doing this, we did abs at the end of the workout. And abs were like a whole bunch of crunch type flexion type variation exercises. That's what we thought was core training. We didn't have the cool work board, wasn't even, didn't exist yet. We were just doing abs at the end of the workout. And you did stuff that 
burn, and made your stomach hurt. That, that seemed that Again, think about that. That was pretty logical. We would we would stay to the art. Doing stuff like just get your stomach tired. And people would say stupid stuff like, yeah, I mean, just get the front row on the back, we'll be fine. They'd say, we said all kinds of idiotic things. And we were perfectly well meaning. I don't think there was any intent to be wrong, any intent to get anybody hurt, right? Then there was a little bit later, there was like the silly core phase, you know, they were sort of all, you know, stability ball. I remember there was a guy in my area who, he was like, I'm the ball guy, we do everything on the ball. You know, because everything's about core training. So then it was like everything was core training, and everything was like, all of a sudden there was like no lifting weights, but everything was sort of like a Cirque du Soleil day, you know, where you were flopping around the stability ball for a half an hour, right? I mean, and you're all out, because you all did that too, right? You're in that, if you're, if you're older than 30 sitting in here, you probably had your silly core stage, right? Then we got into this period, this Australian period, where all of a sudden, Hodges shows up and starts saying that the key is the deep abdominal muscles. You know, Paul Check, the, 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 the idea of uh, hoop tension, right? And so we all went all dead in with Paul Check, and we were like, okay, just pull your belly button, your spine as hard as you can. And then that was going to cure everything. And then we were kind of wrong again, right? And then this character comes along, and this was the guy who really kind of, for me, was like the big knock on the head. I can remember the first time watching him present. And of course, so I'm a freaking genius, just so you understand. And I'm watching this guy present, and he's saying, I'll sh I know how to make a spine explode. He said, we, seriously, he said, we do like, we put these pig spines in these little crunch machines, and we just keep crunching, and eventually the discs blow up. And I was like, okay, so the crunch thing is out, is that what you're saying? <laughs> but that's what people are still arguing. People are still freaking arguing with me. I'm like, the guy said this is how you blow up your spine, like you blow the discs up by doing enough repeat flexion. I think that should be in the out category, right? Oh, Stuart McGill, sorry, I, I should have said that. But, and this, this book, he's, he's got one of his books back, I don't know if this one's there, back again, he's got three or four. But he was the first guy, he was a scientist, like a legit scientist, shows up at these things and said, hey, guess what, I've actually been studying the spine my whole life. And we know some stuff about how this whole thing works, and a lot of what you're doing probably isn't a good idea. And my staff gets really mad at me, because when I hear someone smarter than me, I immediately go back and say to everybody, okay, knock shit off. You know, no more crunches, no more sit-ups. And they're, you know, what are you talking about? You know, what are you gonna do for abs? What are you gonna do if someone says, I want my abs to be sore? Like, I don't know, we'll figure it out, but we're not gonna do this. We're not gonna do stuff anymore that this guy said makes your spine ball. I mean, that would, would be in bad form based on the current level of our education. But the idea is that we've been through this sort of evolution, I guess, in core training, right? Then we get here, this is what's crazy. So, you know, all of a sudden the PRI people show up and they start talking about breathing. And so, this is what the primary muscle of respiration is the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a thin, dome-shaped layer of muscle and tendon that separates the abdominal cavity from the chest cavity. It gains its shape from its attachments and from the organs that surround it, especially the heart, lungs, and liver. The diaphragm attaches at the costals along the lower ribcage, high in the front of the sternum, and deeply in the back along the spine. The diaphragm also attaches to itself via a central tendon, making the diaphragm one of the unique muscles of the body. The diaphragm uses its central tendon and its attachments as leverage to flatten during inhalation. The expansion of the ribs comes from the resistance of the internal organs to downward movement. As the internal organs are slow to move, the ribs expand to make room for the lungs. While the diaphragm... And this is key, so if you realize, and the reason I always put this video up is because I can remember, so Sufi Dalsoni came and spoke to our staff maybe six, seven, eight years ago. And she gets up and she's literally, the first thing she says was, we're gonna talk about my favorite muscle, the diaphragm. And I can remember sitting there thinking, is the diaphragm really a muscle? <laughs> Honestly, that was the first thought that came into my mind. Is it really like, is it like a thing? Like, a, it's like, and then you look, like, is it a muscle? Like, we can't train it, can we? And then you start to, then as Sue's explaining this, you're like, oh yeah, shit, you can train it. By, and this is what Dave was talking about, by breathing. Because this thing is, this is the key 
to the whole thing. It's, I, it's hard to understand how it works because when you inhale, the diaphragm contracts concentrically. And I always use you to talk about trying to explain it simply. Did you ever watch people play the parachute game with kids, like where they have the parachute up, and the kids all run away and pull the parachute down? That's the diaphragm. And that's where like, I might slightly disagree with Daniel about I like the belly breathing idea because I think as the diaphragm comes down, as you inhale and it flattens, it may be okay to get somebody to think, okay, let's let the abdominal, the abdominal muscles or the abdomen descend a little bit. Let's feel what that feels like when the diaphragm is actually working properly. <laughs> so that might, I just kind of sit there to listen to her and say, oh, I might have a teeny bit of disagreement, but the big key is to realize that one, this is a muscle. And that it's a really, really important muscle. So we're gonna put a lot of emphasis when we start talking about core training, the number one thing we're going to figure out is inhale and exhale. We'll, we'll get that one go too much further. That leads me to this, my yoga apology. Because I, I mean, I can't, can't tell you how many times in these things I shit on yoga people. I, like, probably every one I did up until two or three years ago. Because again, now, how many people in here are yoga instructors? Right, so only two of you, or three of you will get insulted. I mean, four, okay. Because like, you can get certified to be a yoga instructor like off the back of a matchbook. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like some guy. Like, you're always like, there's this guy in New York, and I was a yogi. You know, like, what did he do last week? And they were like, oh, he was a financier. He was like, running ahead from it. And then he took, like, a class, and now he's a yoga instructor. It's, and as a result, then those people are going to teach your athletes how to breathe. And I can't tell you how many yoga people I was like, all oh, my athletes breathe. Every freaking one of them. I don't have one dead one that I work with. <laughs> and I was the guy Dan was talking about. Like, I had a wise ass answer all the time. I was like, yeah, if I come across any dead people, I'll teach breathing. But up until that point, I probably just keep doing what I'm doing. And I was so freaking wrong. A hundred percent wrong. I still don't like yoga. <laughs> Sorry. But I get the breathing thing. And I think that's what you've got to look at and realize that you may not have to buy into yoga per se to buy into the idea of breathing. But breathing, and, and again, I can, we can talk about breathing. Dana already did it for an hour. I can go for another hour and still keep talking just about breathing. And she talked about this idea, you don't want to have people blowing up balloons and you don't. I'd still tell you to read this article. So this was the first article from the Postural Restoration Institute that I read, The Value of Blowing Up a Balloon. This is an incredibly good article to read because, and I'm going to have you kind of go through the process with me and just sort of visualize, because what they ask you to do is sit in kind of a flex position and then try to blow up a balloon without your hands. Now the interesting thing that happens, if you think about this process, you have to breathe in through your nose, which Dana talked about, really important, nasal inhale, because there's no other way to do it. You have to blow out your mouth, because there's no other way to do it. And then as you go, you have to just keep going through this process of capping the balloon off all the time with your tongue while you get another breath in through your nose. But what you realize as you get to the end, as the balloon gets big, your stomach is killing you. It's a core workout because you realize end stage exhalation is accomplished by your deep abdominal muscles. If we were gonna think about one thing to remember about what I'm gonna talk about today, remember that end stage exhalation is done by your deep abdominal muscles. That's why Dana was talking about blow up and then just keep blowing out. That's the key. So if you sit here and I, again, yeah, I want you to do this exercise for me. I'm gonna, we're gonna sit here and I'm gonna say, okay, inhale through your nose for three. Don't do it yet. And then I'm gonna tell you, I want you to exhale. I'm gonna count to 10. You can't stop exhaling or trying to exhale until I reach 10. Does everybody understand? So I'm gonna go inhale and you're gonna go. And then I'm going to say exhale, and you're going to exhale out your mouth. While you're doing that, I'm going to count to ten. We got it? Everybody can do that. Everybody, okay, three is one, two, three, and then ten is seven more than that because we're slow. So we'll, we should all be able to do this. All right, so inhale, exhale hard out your mouth. Three, four, Five, keep going, keep going, keep going. Eight, nine, ten. What do you feel? Abdominal tension, right? Because end stage, when we're trying to get that last air out, 
we need to recruit our deep abdominal muscles. That's going to be really critical when we start talking about core training. Watch this. This is talk, you want to talk about core training and deep abdominal musculature? Every stone's probably good at that, but at least that's it. Schwarzenegger's original training partners if you're not old. Uh, but, but when you realize the amount of the abdominal power that it takes to break, try to blow up a balloon until it breaks. Not a hot water bottle, a balloon, a kid's balloon. It's not that easy and your stomach will get tired and then imagine. So you start thinking about deep abdominal musculature. And then think about this, right? Well, in martial arts, they always talk about chi. Like, people are always talking about, and this is the thing, like for thousands of years we've known. Everybody's like, this is the center. You take um, judo, first thing they teach is kia, break fall. And when you fall, they make you yell. Why do they make you yell? Maximum exhalation. When I'm yelling, I'm recruiting my deep abdominal muscles. They didn't know that that's what they were telling you to do, they just knew that that worked. When you're going to fall down, when you're going to get flipped, when you're going to slam into the ground, yell. And that yell is going to cause you to brace, and that brace is going to cause you to, to take that collision with the ground much better. So we've known all this stuff. You know, RKC, I can remember watching, we had a couple of RKC guys come in, and they were doing kettlebells, and they're like, you know, they're making all these noises, and I'm like, God almighty, what is wrong with these people? It's like you got a horse or something in here. But you realize that, again, it has a meaning. They, a lot of times, though, the people don't know the meaning, so they can't explain it to you scientifically. So you just look at it. I think it's just like the hard old kettlebell guys. You know, they got to like, make a big scene about swinging a kettlebell, make all these noises and grunts. And... But then you realize, no, actually, it's, it's a, there's a brilliance to it that maybe they don't even understand themselves. It's just in the system, like, this is what we want you to do. Exhale hard. So just keep thinking. Exhale hard. Exhale hard matters. So the important thing is, you know, why don't all these smart people agree? Why don't, you know, the PRI guys and McGill and, you know, Hodges and whatever. My thing now, I realize that I think everybody disagrees because you can't be an expert if you, if you just come in and say, yeah, those other guys were right. It doesn't sell real well, actually. You're not going to get an hour out of that. Like, yeah, the guy before me, he was pretty much right. So just, I'll just stand here for the next 50 minutes and you guys can look at me. So what they end up doing is they debate the minutia of the whole process. One of my friends calls picking the fly shit out of the pepper, right? You know, and I would say to people, like, you know, they want to, they always want to pick the fly shit out of the pepper. I'm like, don't pick the fly shit out of the pepper. Okay, that stuff's not important. So we're going to try to hit on the big stuff that's important, the common denominators. But this is what's interesting, and this is why, from a personal training, how many people in here do, like, personal training or group, small group or whatever, how many of you are not dealing with athletes? Less than usual. But 50 billion, that's a B, on back pain. It's a lot of money. You can make a living, if you can train people and make their backs feel better, they will tell all their friends. I swear, like that, our, our personal training business is like our personal training in our adult business just continues to grow and grow and grow. And our athlete business hasn't grown nearly as much as our adult business or as a personal training business, and I honestly believe it's because we're not stupid and we don't hurt people. <laughs> we get people to feel better. And they tell their friends. 50 billion. 650,000 surgical procedures are performed annually with a cost exceeding 20 billion. That's rods and discs and all kinds of craziness that a lot of people, in all honesty, I, I would tell you that a vast majority of people probably didn't need. But people are looking for pain relief. And most people, again, will, I always look and think, we're the greatest medical practitioners in the world in this room right here. 
The greatest medical practitioners are not in hospitals. Hospitals are like school of last resort. But most people will just immediately go to the last resort as opposed to the first resort, instead of looking and thinking, wow, wow, if I actually did exercise and if I actually did learn to breathe and if I actually did learn to do these things, I might feel better. Instead, they just run off and have spinal surgery, which is nuts. But there's also, I, I can soapbox this for an hour, but there's not a lot of money in our industry. There's a lot. Okay? 50 billion in back pain, and that probably doesn't include drugs. Might be a hundred billion dollar industry. Just, just, that's just back pain. So, but this is what's most interesting. Stanley Paris, who is regarded as the father of physical therapy, said, pain never precedes dysfunction. So when we start talking about what the, the keys, what the things that are gonna start the problem, start the ball rolling, they're dysfunctions, very predictable dysfunctions that people are going to have for a while, and then their back's going to hurt. It won't go in reverse. They won't have back pain and then get dysfunction. They'll have dysfunction and get back pain. So there's really only, I mean, if we think about back pain, there's two types. There's basically flexion-related back pain. There's extension-related back pain. If we think about extension-related back pain, we can think about, again, weightlifting, squatting, Olympic lifting, gymnastics, offensive linemen in football, um, baseball players, pitchers, you know, anybody who's going to be doing a lot of forced extension will be in the extension-related back pain category. And then there's flexion-related back pain. Flexion-related back pain is the stuff that you get from getting old, from sitting, from not moving, from having all this passive tissue under tension all the time being pulled on. And it'll fall down really into most of, you know, one of those two categories. And really, then you'll have two sets of problems. One, lumbar flexion for hip flexion. So someone can have like a weak or inhibited so like hip flexion don't work well. And as a result, they'll flex their spine a lot. And or lumbar extension for hip extension. Someone will have weak glutes. And instead of being able to move their hip, they'll move their spine. So we can see somebody who may not necessarily be prone to extension problems in terms of they may not be an offensive lineman or a gymnast or one of those. But because they have no ass, they're going to move their back a lot. We'll show you what that looks like, right? So watch. This is Trisha, one of my athletes. And I said, this is something. Literally, I said to her, do this as wrong as you can. <laughs> now, that's But The interesting thing about that is I can tell you that I go to gyms all the time. Actually, that's not what I thought it was too. I can go to gyms a lot and see people doing I'll, I've watched people do that and then ask them, you know, just curiosity, what are you doing? I'm doing my back exercises that my physical therapist showed me. <laughs> thinking to myself, did your physical therapist actually show you that? Or is that what you think your physical therapist showed you? It's hard, it's like a telephone game. You know, if I started on this side of the room and I told you something and then you whispered it and then we got all the way over to where that my man is standing in the back. It wouldn't be the same thing. That's exercise a lot. Like that person might have been told, I need you to be able to use your glutes and move your hip in the presence of a stable core. And then that person may have ended up doing that. Because they have no idea what they're doing. Because then you can start with like lousy motor control. Absolutely. Lousy core stability. Absolutely. I've got to be able to get that person and say, okay, can you get here? This is what we're going to do with the practical. Can you extend your hip without moving your spine? If I can extend my hip without moving my spine, I'm probably not going to be prone to these extension-related disorders. The flip side is this. So again, I asked her, flex your hip. She had a perfect hip flexion pattern. If you ask a lot of your adult clients to do this, you know what you're going to see? Watch, she'll do it again. It's hard. She's, like, she was in three Olympics, so it's hard to get her to do things badly. She does everything really well. But Whenever you watch somebody, I can watch somebody in warm up, and if they go to, to do a knee hug and then they bring their chest down to meet their knee, I'll be like, does your back hurt? And they'll used to say, yeah, all the time. I'm like, yeah, because I mean, if you think about it, because again, in that case, just their hip mobility stinks. So in order to create something that looks like the right thing, they initiate all these repeat flexions of their spine. So when I tell people a lot of times, if, if I want to make your back feel better, all I need to do 
is getting it not going to your back. Because it's not your back that's bad. Usually, I say 99% of the time, it's your hips and the things that are around your hips that are bad. And when you can't move your hips, when you can't flex, when you can't extend, when you can't rotate, you will move your spine. Your spine just gets stuck in the middle of this whole mess. And then they end up, oh, I got a bad back. And it's like, oh, I got to get my back fixed. Right? And you're kind of like, well, it's not, it's not about quick fixing your back. Because there's really nothing wrong with your back except the fact that it's attached to your shitty hips. <laughs> right? What you really need to do is go somewhere and get your hips fixed and get someone who can teach you motor control, core stability. Again, we can call it whatever we want. It doesn't really matter. But the idea is that I've got to get you to be able to move without compensatory spinal movement. And it's amazing how many times we'll take people and say, you know what was really good, Chris? Is that I didn't try to start. I was like, I'm just fine by half hour. I have absolutely no idea. It's like, I'm just fine. I'm thinking I have 25 minutes, but I'm not sure. Uh, so you can be smart with them at the same time, as I'm obviously illustrating for you. Right? And then look at this, and you say, well, what is that? You're an FMS person, you're like, oh, that's rotary stability test and the neuro stuff. Yeah? Might be why Greg Cook picked those up, huh? Because if you find somebody that can neuro stuff and you find somebody that has good rotary stability, you'll probably find someone that doesn't have that. Which is why, you know, you, you, what I was saying, see the similarities, right? There's going to be lots of similarities here and a lot less differences. We need to focus ourselves in on the similarities. Assess and evaluate. This is my evaluation. Does that hurt? They say yes. I say, okay, let's not do that. That's freaking amazing that that needs to be said. Okay? And, but again, in our weightlifting world, I have a picture. I just put, I should have put it in this presentation. I'm going to make sure I put it in here. Of a kid getting his fingers caught in the car door. Right? Oh, you're like, exactly. But she, she went like, ooh, exactly. But that's like somebody saying, oh man, I wrecked my back squatting. I can't wait till I can squat again. And I look at people and I'm like, are you an idiot? <laughs> but in weightlifting, yes, absolutely. Oh, people are like, yes, I'm a complete moron. And I just can't wait till I can hurt myself again. I can't wait till I heal up enough to be able to injure myself. But if I, you know, if you said, oh, I slid my hand in the car door, broke all my fingers. And then you look at me and said, it might be six weeks. I'll be good as new, and I can slam those suckers back in that door again, <laughs> right? But you all laugh at that, but it's amazing how many people will get hurt. Oh, I hurt my back deadlifting. I'm going to really work on my core so I can deadlift again. I'm like, that might not be the idea that you were thinking about. But, again, people think, oh, I just want to, I want to be able to do what I used to do before. I want to be able to play in the NBA, right? It's not going to happen for me. But it's amazing how people get stuck on, I want to be able to do what I did before. There's a real good chance you may never be able to do what you did before and be healthy. <laughs> so how do we train the core? When do we train the core? Before our workout, during the workout, as rest, what do we do? One, I think core training is warm. Because it, it's a good time. The things that I'm going to show you today are things that we do in our warm up just about every day. It's an easy place to put it in. But we also do it during the workout. We also do it in rest periods between exercises. So we're going to sprinkle as much core in as often as we possibly can in times when we know it's not going to hurt us. So we might do a plank set in between sets of squats and sets of chin ups. Might be okay to do it 20 second front plank during that rest period. We're going to try to think can we get into all these different periods to get the things that we want. The other thing to think about, our mobility and activation, well, it's mobility work. We're going to show you some exercises. I think mobility exercises, activation exercises, and core exercises are probably a lot of times the same thing. And it's really a function of how do you do them? What is your intent when you're doing the exercise? We'll get to specific examples so you can see it. You know, glute activation. Glute activation, absolutely, core exercise. You know, people all do glute activation. I mean, whatever, I don't you know, can you activate your glutes, your glutes really underactive, whatever, but if we're going to bridge, bridging is core training, therefore glute activation is core training, right? Motor control exercises, core training, yep, motor control exercises, core. are some stretches, 
core exercises. Yep, we'll show you a really good hamstring stretch, quote unquote. That's just the core exercise. So, what I want you to think about is that core training is going to be part of a really smart warm up. The good thing for us is that we can lie. That's a really good thing. Because you can lie to clients. There's no like, you know, you don't sign a truthful disclosure, like I'm going to tell you the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me go. Like, there's none of that shit before the workout. Like, you don't raise your hand. So you can just bullshit them. Like, hey, this is the warm up. And really, the warm up might be a really good core training motor control circuit. And they could give a shit less than it's a really good core training motor control circuit. But you can. And you need to teach them how to do it. And it doesn't really matter. Some of them, like you get, some of you have that like super type A client who wants to understand everything. Some of you have, like I have sometimes the dumb as a stump professional athlete client who could absolutely care less. It's like his system has always allowed him to do whatever he wanted to do, whenever he wanted to. And usually the small detail oriented stuff is what he's very bad at. And the little gross motor stuff, like it's, you know, I said, you know, hey, you know, run and, you know, jump over that thing over there. No problem. I can do that. But if I say slow down really, really slow and think about what your hips are doing, you can't do it. So core training is really a process of neuromuscular re-education. You're going to try to teach somebody how to move differently than the way they want to. Because we don't move well, we move easy. And the, the best analogy I always have, somebody said, it's like water going down a hill. If you took a wheelbarrow full of water to the top of a hill and you dumped the wheelbarrow out, the water would not go straight down the hill, right? The water would find the path to tap these, this guy, they said path of least resistance. The water would find the path of least resistance to get to the bottom of the hill. Because water's really smart, right? We need to be smart. We need to realize that, okay, we don't want to find the path of least resistance. And in a lot of ways, that's how our body is. We don't figure out the right way to do stuff. We figure out the easy way to do stuff. What's the easiest way for me to move? That may not necessarily be the right way. And then we've got to learn to stabilize against greater and greater forces. So we're going to make it progressively harder. We're going to give them more stability challenge. Go. So this is one of my favorite core exercises. Exhale to help people breathe better. 
And that guy, Dan, talked about nasal inhale, nasal inhale matters. I was one of those people, again, I'm a moron. I've had every stupid argument with everybody that I'm talking to you about. I just did it sooner than you guys. Right? But I was always I can't breathe through my nose. And I really can't. Like, if you look at my nose, I have deviated stuff though. But I, I realized that, well, I can't actually breathe through my nose. I just have to try. So when someone says to you, oh, I can't breathe through my nose, you have to say to them, close your mouth and try. And then you'll realize, and I tell everybody, this is how I teach core training now. I want you to breathe in like a 12 year old that snots. You know, you ever have a 12 year old that can listen to like, blow your nose, I don't need to. And you're like, you hear stuff rattling around by his eyes somewhere. And you know, you're like, you need to just blow that stuff out. They're like, no, fine. And then you look and it's like, down their face. <laughs> but that's how I want you to inhale. I want you to inhale hard like you mean it through your nose. And I always said, I want you to exhale hard like you're blowing out candles at my birthday party. It is 59. You gotta be like, <sighs> like I want spit coming out. I want dust balls on the floor moving around. I want shit moving because you're breathing out really, really hard. If I can get that piece in core training, I can change everything. But it's amazing what happens, how hard just to get them to do that is really, really hard. Really hard to get people. And again, this is why I can remember I listened to Brett Jones one time. He was talking about, you need to check the person's breathing. And I used to always think, no idea how to check their breathing beyond like, okay, it looks like whatever, they're breathing. And then he said, no, you need to check for dysfunctional breathing. And I was kind of like, how do I think? I mean, if you're breathing, it seems like it's pretty functional, right? But then I took one of my older clients and I said, okay, here's what I need to do. We were lying down, but I'll do it sitting up so you can see. And I said, I need you to breathe in through your nose and exhale out your mouth. Do you understand? Now, this guy's a doctor. World famous plastic surgeon. He's like, yeah. I said, okay, so I want you to take a big inhale through your nose, and then I want you to exhale your mouth. And he went like this, okay. <gasps> and I was like, oh, that's dysfunctional breathing. Okay, I get it. Like, when I tell you to do something and you do the polar opposite, that would be what dysfunctional breathing looks like. And then I realized it was that simple with everybody. Because it's amazing how many times you'll say to somebody, I need you to breathe in through your nose, and they'll go, okay. Or I need you to breathe in, and I need you to not move your upper body. I need you to not shrug your shoulders. Because again, think about breathing. I, I wish I'd been able to film this guy. I watched this political consultant on CNN one time, and you could literally see his necktie, like going, like, honest to God, it was unbelievable. And here I am, of course, I'm just watching him, fascinated by the fact that like this guy's gonna die right here on, <laughs> like, on TV. But you talk about dysfunctional breathing, and you look at that guy, and you think when you ask somebody, okay. Take a big breath in through your nose. And the person goes, <gasps> and they go, does your neck hurt all the time? And I'm like, yep. Because <laughs> your traps and your scalings, one thing you realize when you study your anatomy of breathing, these are all accessory breathing mu muscles. When you get tired, your scalenes and your sternocleidomastoids and your traps, they help you to breathe when you're tired. But they're not supposed to be primary respiratory muscles. They're not supposed to be primary inspiratory muscles. But again, look at a lot of your older clients and what you'll see, as soon as you ask them to breathe. <gasps> the pump's up here, I always say what I said, the pump's up here, your neck's gonna hurt. If I can switch the pump down to here, your neck pain will go away. And I know it works because it's happened for me. I used to have terrible neck spasms. I did neck spasms. I used to carry a circle call in my backpack on road trips. Like this, I would have a circle call so that like, when my neck went out, I'd be able to go home with a call on in the airplane. I don't have that stuff anymore. And I'm 100% convinced it's because of the amount of breathing stuff that we do. So when, we, when we're teaching it, I'm teaching that exercise, both legs up, so if I'm here, and leg lower, right? I wanna be here, both legs up, big nasal inhale, exhale hard, I just don't blow your leg down. Back up, big inhale, blow your leg down. Now again, my client's gonna look at that and think, oh, that's the hamstring stretching part. Whatever. <laughs> that's what you think it is, great. As long as you do it the way that I want you to do it, I don't really care that you don't understand the nuances of leg lowering. I only understand that you're doing what I ask you to do, which again, is keep your head on the ground, because what will your client do? Boom, right away. Head up off the ground. Big gulp through their mouth. Ribs up, like all these things. Like what we've got to do is realize we've got to coach all this core stability stuff 
in the midst of everything else. And that's what we're going to do in the practical stuff. Um, we'll get to that. Total six. Am I done at 12 15? Okay, so I get nine minutes. So this is important. Because when we start thinking about core training, we have to think about this idea of functional anatomy or dysfunctional anatomy. So, because that's why when people ask about like sit ups and crunches, and I had to find one idiot that would demonstrate this stuff. So that was me. So didn't want to make anybody else do it. That stuff's stupid. Cut it, it's mainly stupid because if you think about this whole day, idea of functional training, I always say functional training is the application of functional anatomy to training. There is no, actually, there are two points in the day when your abdominal muscles function as flexors. He knows he's seen me before, I think. He knows my jokes. When you get up in the morning, right? You do one crunch so you can get out of bed. At that point in time, your abdominal muscles function as a flexor. In my case, that happens twice because I take a nap every day. So twice a day, I do two crunches a day. Usually slightly rotational crunches because I gotta get off the couch. So, um, but the rest of the time, these muscles are anti-extension muscles. This is the other thing we start thinking about core training. You have to know what the muscles do. These muscles prevent, you know, Dana was talking about like the toe walking child, right? Sadly, that toe walking child is happier sprinters and jumpers too. You know, you look at somebody walking around and sprinters and jumpers, what do they got? They got hamstring problems, they got back pain, right? And they walk around and their ass sticks up, their stomach sticks up, and people, and I'm like, hey, that's functional as hell. Those people can jump out of the building and can run, but they don't necessarily feel great. Because we're not opposing the two bowls. Like if you think of your pelvis as a bowl and your rib cage as a bowl, and you want to think that those bowls should basically cover each other, that's when you can start to understand functional bit better. The job of these muscles is to pull those bowls over each other and keep them in position. So I should be pulling up on the bottom of the bowl to get that one to go this way, and I should be pulling down on the top of the bowl to get that one to go this way. And then the jaw is anti-extension. If those muscles don't work, I look like that. If those muscles work, I look like this, right? So when you start to understand functional anatomy, it's entirely different. Right? So here, this is my favorite anti-extension exercise. You can do TRX rollout, ring rollout, whatever suspension trainer you have, roll out, fall out, whatever you want to call it. But the idea is, can I just stress those muscles in the way that I want them to actually work? Right? Versus you know, doing this stuff. Using those muscles again. Using those muscles to do something they're never going to do. And this is what we need to think about all the time when we're thinking about exercise and exercise choices. What are those muscles going to do? Are they ever going to do what we're asking them to do? And again, I used to call it like, have you ever worked, uh, I used to go to the group exercise things and I could always spot the like Pilates teachers, the women, they always walk like this. Because they had stuffed their rib cage down so hard over their pelvis with so many crunches that they literally couldn't straighten themselves up again. And you'd literally see it, you'd walk around and go, oh, Pilates teacher, Pilates teacher, Pilates teacher, Pilates teacher. Probably really good at the 100, right? Flexion, flexion, flexion. But again, it's not good for you. That's not, you're supposed to be balanced, and it's just as bad to be balanced as the other way as it is. One direction is bad, the other direction is bad. That's why if you listen to PRI, where they talk about all the time, neutrality. You just want those bowls right over each other so they cover each other, right? Same thing. What are the muscles on the side of you? Does anybody think that those muscles are lateral flexors? Like, ask, like, when does this happen? Right? I'm a little deep now, like, I don't know. Like, like, it never happens, right? It doesn't happen. There is no lateral flexion as a concept that doesn't exist. Those muscles are anti-lateral flexors. That's why we do that side plank, because that's what you do. You train that muscle to do what it's supposed to do. Prevent side plank. Because again, this is like, this is one of my favorites right here. Again, I do all the stupid ones. Like, I, whenever I see somebody doing that one, I'm just like, you're an idiot, you're an idiot, you're an idiot. And then the bigger idiot has two dumbbells. Because the bigger idiot has never seen a seesaw. You're like, this is totally useless because you have the same weight you can and all you're doing is grinding up your discs. Because you're a moron and have no idea what you're doing. Right? But 
we're training, we don't want to train stabilizers as movers. We want to train stabilizers as stabilizers. And that's why you go back to like the McGill thing, and I can remember sitting listening to McGill and saying, yeah, I'm studying strongman. And I was like, why is he studying strongman? It didn't, again, and one of the things I realized is to just keep my mouth shut most of the time. And you know, you always think, it's like, you can be quiet and not prove what an idiot you are, or you can open your mouth and let everybody know. So sometimes I'll just sit there and be like, all right, I don't really know why he's doing this, but he's smarter than me, so I'm gonna kind of bear with him through this. But one of the things that he said is, these guys like yoke carries was one of the highest hip loads he ever recorded. He said, we recorded hip loads that we thought were impossible. And I was like, hmm, and then I started thinking, now again, right? Similarities. Dan John talking about loaded carries. Everybody should do loaded carries. And all of a sudden I went from like loaded carries being like, this is like dumb shit. Like, I don't know, like why are you running around with dumbbells? I don't get it. To thinking, oh, now I understand what's going on here. And then I started thinking about suitcase carry. Well, if I, because what's holding one dumbbell or kettlebell and walking except a moving side pump, right? So all of a sudden, you know, stuff that I thought was stupid suddenly got to be really smart. Why? Because I got the stupid, right? <laughs> As you get later, they talk about when the, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And it's that way. As you get less and less, you start to go, oh, I get it. I just did all of them, but not really. Right? See, the end is, you know, whatever, entire chase press. I refuse to call this challenge press because John works at our facility, so I don't give him any credit at all, ever. But again, the entire rotation press, right? What are we doing? Lengthen the lever, shorten the lever. Lengthen the lever, shorten the lever. I can remember reading mechanical low back pain, Porterfield's Rose, for the first time. And and seeing words, I can remember seeing the word anti-rotation, anti-lateral flexion, anti-extension, and going, oh, wow, I didn't even think those were words. Now I'm looking at it and thinking, those are really smart words. That now have been incorporated into really everybody's vocabulary. Now it's very common to hear people talk about anti-rotation, or anti-lateral flexion, or anti-extension. But when I first looked at that book 10 years ago, I went, and it was, you know, the, the, the light dawning on marble head, you know, it was kind of like, Oh yeah, I get it now. Those muscles, like they were supposed to make you not do something. That was a, an epiphany for me. But the good thing was we went back and we jumped all that other stuff. See you later. I, I never stayed married to bad ideas. This is my favorite one: wood choppers. I don't even know. I couldn't even do a really bad wood chopper because I don't even know how. But I love that one. People are like, you know, we do wood choppers. Like, what is that? I don't even know what, like, I don't even know what those exercises are. And then people are, I'm like, who needs wood choppers? Maybe people that chop wood, but they don't need wood choppers because they chop wood. So I don't think anybody does. But suddenly we saw all these other diagonal patterns and stability patterns that we could use. This is the argument that everybody will give you, though. Oh, but you know, you've got to be able to rotate. And what I'm waiting to realize, if you watch, this is actually my son, right? His spine doesn't rotate, his hips do. And it's amazing how many people will try to defend rotation versus anti-rotation with, well, I train tennis players, or I train golfers, and they've got to be able to rotate. And I'm like, no, they don't. They have to have hip internal and external rotation. They do not have to have spinal rotation. Spinal rotation is not a good idea. In fact, it's a bad idea. It's deliberately limited. If you look at the way the spine was built, there's a reason the big blocks are on the bottom, kids. Because it's not supposed to move. And any attempt to make it move is bad theory. You know, you look at the same thing, right? Hip internal external rotation. Everything that you see in sport, hitting a baseball, it's all hip internal external rotation. It's not lumbar rotation. And somehow, you know, the same way you know, people would be doing like these rotational things like this, and I cringe, I'm like, oh my God, that's, if you ask me how to hurt somebody, I would tell you that is the way. Get that person and fix the lower part and then force them to rotate the other part. Guaranteed to produce injury. If you look at Cheryl Sarmon's book, she calls it particularly dangerous. I always say, if you look at the book, it literally doesn't say dangerous. It says particularly dangerous. All right, I have one minute. And so, as a result, I just, this is what I want to close with, though, because when you start thinking about training and saying, I don't go out of time, 
I think one leg squats are a really good core training. If someone's saying to me, I don't have a lot of time, and I want to make sure we're incorporating some good core stuff in the workout, I'd tell you one, one leg squats. Two, some sort of standing cable pressing for pushing. Because again, we can press and force that person to have to use that anti-extension capability that they have. And or just good old plain old push-ups, because push-ups are nothing more than moving planks, right? Or single dumbbell for anti-rotation type stuff. So the important thing to understand, again, suspension training from a pulling standpoint, Think about how can I incorporate core training. Whenever I have anybody with a bad back, these are the exercises that they're doing. Because I want to think about how can I incorporate as much core training in the lifting part of the workout as possible. Mm -hmm. Same thing, rowing, single arm, one arm, one leg row. Again, great, great core training. It's gonna be really beneficial for people who have problems. So. With that said, in the practical, all this stuff is it's on DVD in the back. If you want, there's way more of this. It's in your book. We, Chris was giving me a hard time because I think I have 150 slides or something in the book, and I knew I was going to get them all. But we will, in the practical part, we'll go over kind of the how to, you know, bridging, single leg bridging, leg lower. We'll go through all this stuff. And hopefully, if you have questions, let's save them for that so you guys can get to eat lunch. Um, bring your question just so that you know if you have questions. I do not want to answer your questions now individually, okay? Because questions are good for everybody, and lunch is good for me. <laughs> and so, if you interrupt my lunch for your question, that's a double negative. But write down right now what you want to know so that when we start your group, we can hit that stuff in the beginning.